It was a, a, quite an experience because we had lost an awful lot. Uh, we could tell uh, from our firing where we had lost so many people there, and it was no, there was no cover at all. Uh, I was with the 4th Arm Fourth Armored Division at this time, and uh, as you may recall from your history, that the 4th Armored was the outfit that came up from the south and broke through the uh, lines and hooked up with the uh, people from the 101st uh, Airborne and other Airborne, whatever stragglers there were around, to, in effect, liberate Bastogne. This was after, oh, six months or so, no, six weeks or so. And uh, it was, as you've heard, uh, a very bad situation. Our 106th Infantry Division that was in line when the uh, Germans broke through uh, was badly mauled. Uh, they had just come online, and most of them were were very new. Uh, they took the brunt of the uh, Battle of the Bulge. Well, uh, we began to collapse from the north and the south, and if the British had just been a little bit quicker and cut out a couple of their tea breaks. We could have closed up the gap right there and saved an awful lot of fighting later on on either side of the Rhine River. But uh, we did manage to uh, get that enveloped and then our instructions were here, load up with all these sea rations and head off with the 4th Armored for the Rhine. And when you get there, you stop and help everybody else across, but don't you go across. We didn't go across till everybody else was across much, much. And um, finally, uh, we had gone back down to the Saar region and uh, been fighting the war from there. We picked up the same old ammunition that we had dumped there uh, when we headed north. And uh, as a matter of fact, as a short time, we were attached to the 7th Armored, the 7th Army, and found out what the 7th Army had been doing down in southern France. And we found out that they played a lot of baseball and some other things that we never heard about. But uh, we uh, took off then uh, for the Rhine. And I recall being on Good Friday, this was, uh, on the west side of the Rhine. And I had a map that had uh, every block in the town of... Um, well, I had it in mind a minute ago. You know, after 70 years, things begin to blur a little bit. Uh, uh, but we had, uh, it starts with an M, and uh, it was full of SSers, and they just wouldn't get out of there so that we could make our jump across the Rhine with the balance of our forces. So we sat there on Good Friday and went up one block and down the next, up one, down the next, with our 105, 155 millimeter howitzers till we had that, all the SSers, SSers cleaned out of there. And then we went across. And um, that was the last, I think, real tough fight that we had. After that, we were out on the Audubon, and there were two lines, 
and the line in the middle. We were the prisoners coming back, the Germans, filled the whole center of the Audubon, and uh, we were moving as fast as possible on either side. Uh, we then uh, made our way down to uh, Berchtesgaden in Austria, and I'll have to say this for Hitler, he did know how to pick out some beautiful country, because his, uh, his area there, those of you that have been there and recently know that what beautiful country that is. And we were probably about the first to go up in the hawk's nest all the way up, because the glass was still on the floor uh, at that time. And uh, we just admired the place that he had there. Then we kept on going east, and finally, uh, cross over into Czechoslovakia just before the war was over. I remember we were in this field in, just inside Czechoslovakia when we had uh, somebody from Ike's headquarters uh, read a pronouncement of the end of the war. Well, we really didn't believe it, uh, but when we were told to uh, unload the round that we had in the in our howitzer, well, we figured it was pretty much it. So we were told then, that, okay, now we're peace ar you're, in a, you're in a peace army, so get ready for inspections. So we started cleaning the guns, and <laughs> we had fired something over 50,000 rounds, and we were, and the guns were t pretty dirty, and we were proud of that, because they had done a lot of, a lot of damage. Uh, uh, but we had to start cleaning them up and waiting for inspection after inspection after inspection. Now, I'm sure I've left out an awful lot, but we'll catch some of that in the questions I expect. But Greg, is there anything else you want? Not right now, but if you pass that to Mr. Dunn, thank you so much, and uh, we appreciate the perspective. Thank you. out there. Back in those days in the Army, there was a word that was new for me, maybe new for you in those days. It applies somehow or other to today in my mind. Um, we're here, I thought, to talk about D-Day, and yet you're here talking about Iwo Jima. When D-Day hit, I was, I was in Colorado uh, training to rock, climb rocks, and we were told it's D-Day uh, long before I ever saw combat. And so I, I'm wondering about today and the agenda. Uh, the word that I learned when I joined the Army was snafu. <laughs> is, is there an element of that in this? In this agenda, Greg, this is uh, <laughs> Anyhow, Big. I'm here to put out a word about the 10th Mountain Division. It started in 1943, and I was there when it started. But going back, I, was, I grew up in a little town near Pittsburgh called Ben Avon Heights. Ben Evan Heights was on a hill, uh, a number of hills, and the wind was fierce in the winter. But we had great snowstorms. In the basement of my house, there were a couple of boards that sort of looked like skis. They were maybe four feet long. They had they were boards with points on them and binders that were a little leather strap. 
when I was about 10 years old, I used those skis out on the hills of Ben Avon Heights, and they were great. Now, fast forward about 10 years to 1942, I was in college. We'd gone through Pearl Harbor, 1941, and I was a sophomore in a school in Over East, and uh, the war was really getting going. I remember seeing a newspaper back around the fall of 1942, the New York Herald Tribune, and it had the name of the new Allied commander in Africa. And uh, it was a name I couldn't pronounce, Eisenhower. That was when they announced this General Ike Eisenhower was to be the Allied commander. And so uh, the, the feeling among the, our classmates was we had to get in the Army or the Navy or something or we'd be drafted. And at about that time, in our college newspaper, there was a little advertisement on the front page. It was signed by a guy named Minnie Dole. <clears throat> he was the head of the National Ski Patrol. I learned later that he had gone before General Marshall and told the general that the U.S. military needed mountain soldiers. And General Marshall brushed him off for six months or a year. Ultimately, Minnie Dole got to talk to the president, making the proposal that the military needed mountain-trained soldiers. And Roosevelt brushed him off. But as the war got more heated, they listened to him. And so this announcement in the newspaper was signed by Minnie Dole, and it said, ski troopers, if you wanted to be a ski trooper, and if you know how to ski and have a background in skiing, write to me in New York City. Well, I knew skiing in Van Avon Heights on these boards, <laughs> but I thought, boy, would I love to be a ski trooper. And so I sent in the letter. And I guess a whole lot of other guys from schools in New England especially. And we all, in a few months, wound up in Pando, Colorado. And that's where I spent with the group that became the 10th Mountain Division. We trained for over two years. It was not a happy time. Uh, I'll tell you, these New England prep school smoothies that were out there, uh, if they didn't know the F word when they got there, they learned to use it a lot, <laughs> <clears throat> as did I. <laughs> they, the night we landed there in Camp Hale, we were boarded on trucks, and our truck was dropped. We dropped us, they dropped us off at one of the barracks, and that, the guys in that barracks became the second platoon. The 2nd Platoon had been my outfit all through the war. I mentioned the names of several of the men there, Gil Madsen, Martin Murray, Sharding Helby, Harding Shelby. We all trained together for over two years. We thought it was pretty rough. They had us living in the Colorado mountains. Many nights, they called it tactical. We couldn't have fires. Our boots were wet or our shoes, our socks were wet. If we were to sleep, we had sleeping bags. We'd get boughs of trees, put them down, and then sleep in sleeping bags. I'm pretty old now. I, I, I couldn't do what I did then to get in one of those sleeping bags and try to take off my shoes, and they were wet, take off my socks, wrap them around my belly to try and dry them out at night. 
we really thought it was a pretty rough life. But in time, they called us into combat. And uh, we, were, we went on troop ships. But the war was closing down. It was now 1944, late, the Battle of Budge, the Battle of the Budge. I wonder if I can't even say that. Um, we were on the high seas when that battle was going on. We, the 10th Mountain Division, we had no idea where we were going, but we didn't get into that Battle of the Bulge. Thank God for us. It must have been dreadful, and you were there in the battle. Um, we, got, we went to Italy and were taken very quickly up to the northern Italy into the Apennine Mountains where the Germans were retreating but holding on stubbornly to the Italian boot. I'm going to drink a little here. First place we, st my time going too long, Greg. You're quite fine. Um, first place we stopped was a little Italian mountain town called Cotigliano. And they sent us up on a high, high hill above the village and to take over the house of a poor farmer and his wife. Well, I think we pushed them into one corner and uh, I don't know, 20 of us maybe, lived in that house for a couple of weeks. Uh, the Germans were up north of us and occasionally sending shells over um, artillery, but it was pretty peaceful. This was January of 1945. Now, you know that the war ended in May, so we were in the home stretch. We didn't know that, but on the other hand, the news reports were saying, <clears throat> how the Allies and the Russians were closing in on the Germans. So ultimately, we left that, oh, I wanted to tell you, I had, in that little town, I went down the hill into the village once, and for the first time in my life, I went to a barber shop where I had a shave and a haircut. It was fantastic. <clears throat> well, we were then, told on a certain day in March that we were to jump off and really go after the Germans and take the town of Iola. <clears throat> so that meant the real thing, active combat, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I remember the, the knot I had in my stomach and I had it all day long. I'd never seen a, a dead soldier until that day. And I was told by the lieutenant to, to go back and look for Gil Madsen. Now Gil was one of our team. He was from Norway. I don't know how he got into our outfit, but he was from Norway. And I went back and I found him. He was lying on a field, <clears throat> and I was breathing heavily, and I couldn't tell whether or not he was alive. His eyes were open, blue eyes. I called to him. I don't, I'm sure he was dead, but I didn't want to admit it. But that was the first experience of countless dead soldiers that I was with after that day. Um, incidentally, Iola, make a mental note of that if there's any chance that any of you or your friends or family would go to Italy. Put Iola on the, on the map. It's a little town <clears throat> where we did battle with the Germans. We took the town. And after the war was over, long after the war was over, one of the parents of a boy in our outfit who had lost his life, <clears throat> they went to Iola 
to see where their son had died. And the village people had gathered all the memorabilia, the artifact from the battle, and they made a museum out of it. <clears throat> it's a neat little museum. My family and I went to see it with Professors Hahn and Mansoor. They took us to check it out, and we did. And in fact, uh, my family and I made a contribution to that museum. And so they have a picture up of the 10th Mountain Division. They didn't have that in the museum before, and I thought they should have, because we really, that's where we had done our early fighting. Anyhow, the last day for me was April 15, <clears throat> three weeks before the war ended. I had become the leader of the second platoon. Something had happened to our lieutenant before we started this attack on the Germans. <clears throat> this was the final push of the war. <clears throat> We had gone all day pursuing the Germans, firing at them, and being fired at. The second platoon should have been 40 or 41 men. And that day, we were by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we were down to about 20 men. <clears throat> I had hoped at that point it would be the end of the day. It was hot, we, I mean, it was April 15, it was a warm day. I hadn't been careful with my water, my the water in my canteen, and I was dry, very thirsty. I was told that Captain Faust wanted to see me at the top of the hill. <clears throat> I think, I thought, oh Lord, but I went up the, to the top and found him. He was a great human being, but he said, at four o'clock, I want you to take your men, go down the hill in front of us, and across from us was Hill 775. I want you to take that hill. He said, I'll send artillery on it at 10 minutes of four. And then at four o'clock, you take off and do it. I went back to the men. Martin Murray was still there and Harding Shelby and other, some of them old buddies of mine. <clears throat> and I told them that we had ahead of us a rough assignment. So at 10 of four, the artillery began, and at four o'clock, we jumped off, kind of single file going through the woods, got out into open ground on the low ground, it was open. We ran across that, there was a road, we crossed the road and started climbing Hill 775. It was peaceful until we were about Oh, I don't know, maybe a fourth of the way up or a third of the way up. Went from out of the top of the hill, came in the fire of a machine gun, blasting down on us. It hit a couple of our men. I'm sure they didn't survive that day. <clears throat> the rest of us were, to, were able to get on our bellies and the gun, the firing, was over our heads. I can't remember everything. I know that half of our men or, or less had not come out of the woods. I had a radio, a walkie-talkie, and I was probably screaming into that, where are the rest of the men? But for those of you who have been in the artillery or the infantry, I think it's standard that you need a sergeant bringing up the rear who polices the men because some guy is going to stop and the guy behind him will stop unless they're, they're policed and 
their butts are kicked and they have to get up and face combat and that somehow or other we didn't have enough men I think to do that and somebody stopped and so I suppose with me were maybe a dozen of us and we lost two or three in the machine gun and then I did a terrible thing on the right side of the mountain there was a gulch and I thought I had the brilliant idea to get in that gulch and wake, work our way up. So I went to Harding Shelby, or I called to him. You've heard me speak of him. He was, he was a football player at the University of Vander, Vanderbilt University, a tremendous, lovable human being. And I said to him to take his men, which I think he had about two of them left, and work his way up the gulch. Well, they were killed in that gulch, all three of them. The rest of us were on the hill trying